Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Wayne, Wayne Wayne Tran, what you what, what, Wayne Bryant. And there's Jerry Jerome Rowland over there. And this is Stuff You Should Know. Yeah. Kill me episode. <laughs> Whatever, dude. This is fine. You knew I was going to say that. I know. It's again. We just did an economics episode. What was it? I don't know, but I think economics is literally right there, besides like chemistry and physics for me now. Maybe worse the, because at least those are interesting to me. Chemistry and physics still make sense because they're really hard to understand. Economics doesn't make sense because it's, it's BS. <laughs> And it's just that's so, the like, key to understanding economics. I'm good. Here, I'll tell you where I'm going to need help. I'm good except for like four paragraphs right there where it says "kill me." <laughs> <laughs> it really does say "kill me" right there. And then right there where it says "wake up, listeners." <laughs> Whatever. I'm good. So I'm going to need your help there. The I rest of it is, is fine. A, this is a personal challenge to keep everyone interested. Okay. <laughs> that's funny because on the John Muir document, I have blah 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 over like oh, yeah? a couple right. of paragraphs. <laughs> Oh, boy. Is, people it, are is seeing, that where we're headed now? People are seeing how the sausage <laughs> – that's like year one stuff, dude. No, we've been doing that forever. I think we generally are into one another's topics. Yeah, you, you no, think it's John not the – John big uh, – It's not the topic. Phony, and uh, I think economics is boring as heck. I don't think he was – well, we'll talk about John Muir in the John Muir episode. How about that? I was about to defend my position on <laughs> Will that have already been out? I don't know, man. We'll find out. I think people should play these back-to-back. So you should, especially the and cleft then, episode, right. <laughs> because the listener mail from the cleft episode really sets up some of the jokes in the night trap episode that follows. Right. So those don't are, listen to those two yeah. out of order. Well, those are too fun to listen to. I think if listeners listen to these two back to back, it's like film on Louise territory, right into the Grand Canyon. What does that mean? Have you never seen Thelma and Louise? I have, but I don't get how it applies to listening to these episodes out of order. Spoiler alert okay. for Thelma and Louise, everybody. Well, you already kind of mentioned the Grand Canyon. <laughs> they drive into the Grand Canyon at the end, just straight off that cliff. And that's what would happen if they listened to both of these episodes back to back. Well, I'll tell you what. If you watch Thelma and Louise. Okay. Good movie. As they're dri- it really is. As they're- Actually, I've only seen the last 10 minutes, to tell you the truth. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. You're like, what was their problem? Yeah, why'd they do that? <laughs> Seems a little overreacting. Um, the uh, the as you listen really, really closely, I mean, like turn your volume up so loud mm-hmm. that you can hear the fuzz of the video, the grain of the video making it sound. <laughs> okay, you can hear. I can't remember who's Thelma. Oh, God, why'd you ask me? I always get these two confused. I think Jerry is mad I think right now. Gina Davis is. Is Thelma? I thought she was Louise. Okay, Jerry's got it. Jerry's so mad right now. <laughs> so, so it is Thelma. It's Gina Davis. She says, all, it says to Louise, "Well, we can thank John Muir for this beautiful view <laughs> on the way to our deaths, <laughs> because no one else cared about the natural environment until that's he right. came along." <laughs> that's actually absolutely right. He stood alone. No one thought the way that he thought. Oh, that's great. So we're talking about inflation, obviously. <laughs> that was the most fun part of this episode, by the way. No, so. it's not, Chuck. <laughs> Go ahead. I refuse to believe that. We're talking about inflation. Mm-hmm. And the reason that I picked this is because inflation is kind of a thing right now. There's a lot of fear. Yeah. Until today. Yeah, I think until today. Um, when the Fed came out and said, everybody, calm down. Yeah. Stop being dramatic. Joe Biden's not ruining the country. There's not going to be an <laughs> inflation fear. Or there's not going to be inflation. Right. Stop your fears. And as a matter of fact, um, the fear stopped. Everybody stopped worrying about inflation because the Fed came out and said something. Really? Yes. And But the reason I picked this is because uh, it's good to know what people are talking about when they're like, uh, we should be really worried about inflation right now. And all you have to do is understand a few basic things, and all of a sudden, you're in the convo, baby. Sure. And we're going to explain those few basic things to everybody, and then the next time inflation starts to go crazy, you can say, everybody, <laughs> just calm down. Yeah. It's just cost push going on. Yeah, you, you, you'll you be like, uh, at every party you go to, you can talk about that, and you'll be the equivalent of uh, Colleen Robinson. <laughs> Who's that? From uh, What We Do in the Shadows. Is that? The the Energy Vampire. (laughs) Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He probably sits around and talks about inflation. Yeah, yeah. He threw me off with the Colleen. Well, that's how. uh, Yeah, I understand now. No spoiler alert. 
we're watching that again a little bit just because it's good. What we've been watching is and just finishes "I'll Be Gone in the Dark," the great documentary about the Golden State Killer and Michelle McNamara's oh. research and wow, dogged pursuit. It what's it? What's it called? "I'll Be Gone in the Dark." Is it Netflix? No, it's HBO Max, but uh-huh. it's uh, it's great, but it's so heavy. We will then cleanse the palate with uh, reruns of, uh, of uh, what we do in the shadows. Very smart. The great palate cleanser, which is what I'm going to do right after we record this. Okay. <laughs> Are you done stalling now? Yeah. So one of the things that um, really kind of gets people about inflation is the idea that, like, if you go back to the 60s. Yeah, the good old days. You could buy, like, a brand new car for, like, three grand. Cost nothing. Brand new car. And that's when they made them big and shiny. Yeah, you want to, and very unsafe. Do you want a house? All right. Give me, I don't know, $22,000. It's yours. And that's a nice house, too. Very nice house. Uh, like a ticket to a movie costs a dollar. <laughs> now, if you pay a dollar to see a movie, you have to see something terrible like Hidalgo or National Security or something. <laughs> that's like a dollar movie today. This is like good movies. Yeah, the dollar movies were a penny. Right. Yeah, basically. So um, all of this sounds like, or it makes it sound like the good old days were just this cheap, idyllic paradise. But that's just not the case because of inflation, where you can't really compare uh, today's, you know, cars or today's houses or Mm -hmm. today's movie ticket prices without using an adjustment for inflation. Yeah, because I think in 1967, if you were like, if you made a lot of money, Mm -hmm. you made about $19,000 a year. That was a lot of money. Yeah, 60% of American households earn less than $8,300 a year. Uh, And so, yeah, I mean, they have all these inflation calculators. It's one of our favorite things to do Mm -hmm. is go look at inflation calculators online. Um, West Egg. Yeah, West Egg is one I use mostly. Yeah. But there are a couple of more because I think one of them sometimes doesn't go back far enough. But honestly, when it goes back too far, it's just a little bit of like, I don't know. This seems about right. (laughs) Right. Well, that was the thing. Do you remember when when, – I can't remember what we were talking about. But it wasn't too long ago. And I was saying like – I don't think this fully captures it, this ad- adjustment for inflation. I yeah. think things were cheaper or things were more expensive. And that's the point of, of like, tracking inflation mm-hmm. is to say, actually, yes, things were more uh, expensive back then. Things do actually get cheaper over time because technology becomes more less novel. Yeah, some and, stuff, sure. Oh, so, for example, like a TV. Like, if you wanted to buy a new color TV when it came out in the 60s, mm-hmm. um, you paid probably about $1,000 for that. For that TV, right? That's a crazy price back then. It was an enormous price. Mm -hmm. Like you would pay – that would mean then in today's dollars that you would pay something like 10 grand for a new TV. Yeah, and TVs when they first started coming out with the new flat screens were really expensive. And then like you said, that technology gets better and they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper where now you can get a – I mean it depends on what kind of flat screen. But you can get a good flat screen for 500 bucks. Tops. A decent one for 500 bucks. Yeah. Tops. I mean, you walk into Costco, they just give you one for walking in. Yeah, that's true. And it's huge. <laughs> they're huge. They're much better. They're enormous. They're yes. lighter. They look better. And they're cheaper. I think like a TV today, like a 60 inch TV is about a 20th of that, that how much it would cost the person yeah. in like 1954 buying that color TV. So all of this kind of goes to say like prices may go up over time but they actually relatively might actually be going down too right or they could just be going up thankfully there are people who track this kind of stuff because when you look at inflation when you look at the the cost of or price the rise of prices over time that's what inflation is one, one way to put it yeah overall prices goods and services it's yeah. not just like oh gas is a lot for the next 3 months cuz it's summertime that's not inflation right Right. It's more like Hubba Bubba costs way more today than it did when we were kids. (laughs) Sure. That's a good example of inflation. But it's a general rise in prices. And if you track this stuff, you can actually track, allegedly, the health of your economy and make, allegedly, good decisions on how to juice that economy to keep it growing at a steady, controllable rate, but ever upward. Right, which is what the Fed does. Uh, Did we do one on the Fed? Or have we just danced around them a lot? I don't remember. I know we've done one on currency, how much money Pretty there good. is in the world. Not bad. We did one on stagflation, which we'll mention in a few. Yeah, that was all right. 
I thought it was groundbreaking. We did a whole uh, – remember when all the rage was those uh, – Super stuff guides? Yeah, the super stuff guide. Yeah. The audio books. We did one on economics. Remember that guy who was like chicken? He kept using chicken as an example. Really? Yeah, he was great. And then – yeah, well, there, it was a good It was a good listen if you ask me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm glad those didn't become a thing though. Why? I don't know. It's a lot of work for Jerry and us. And Jerry loved it. No, she didn't. She keeps asking when we're going to bring those back. <laughs> so there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of ways to look at this, and it's funny how like when you look at most of this stuff, economists don't all agree. There's a lot of chicken and the egg stuff going on. Chicken, where <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> where it's like you're just saying the same thing in a different way. It's still the same thing. And, yes. <laughs> and this is sort of the first example. Which it's a little is, maddening, isn't it? It is because some people say. You know what? In a free market and an open market, it's just supply and demand like it always has been. Right. Uh, if the product has is greater in supply, it's going to go up in price. Uh, if it's greater than demand, then prices are going to go down. Mm-hmm. And it's really just as simple as that for these products and for money yeah. and cash. Yeah. And some people say, well, no, that's not true at all. Uh, inflation is the thing that happens first. And you don't increase the supply of money beyond demand. Because some people say, oh, well, the Fed just increases the supply of money. Right. And they did it too much, and now prices right. are going up. Because another way to put it is not just that prices rise, but that inflation actually is a decrease in the buying power of the dollar. Yeah, which is, again, I know the exact same way to say this uh, the, the other one. I know, but it, it's like the, the nuance so is— So nitpicky. It, it really is very nitpicky, but we're talking macroeconomics for, like, you know, the, the money of 300 million people and, like, how it kind of moves and interacts. So, mm-hmm. like, if you could figure this out, if you could just kind of crack the code— Right. I mean— But you can't. You could do anything. They haven't been able to so far, and inflation is a really good example of that because nobody can agree on exactly, like you're saying— what what causes it? So one way to look at it is is that you can split explanations in a couple of ways. Is it based on a change in the demand or the cost of goods or services or the products, or is it because of money? So the first one is that money thing, where there's too much money on the market. Right, which just if you don't get into economics, that just sounds like a, a mind-numbing thing to even think about. But it's it's really simple to understand. Money's just like anything else. If there's a lot of money, mm-hmm. there's a big supply. And that means anybody has it. Who cares? Which means that there's um, less value to it. Yeah, and that's not just cash and circulation. It's cash and credit. It's mm-hmm. like everything we think of as – uh, kind of like buying power, I guess. Yeah, and another way to look at it is if there's a lot of money on the market, mm-hmm. that means the average person has more money than usual. Mm-hmm. That means that they can buy more stuff than usual. Right. That means that more people are requesting, trying to buy. Demand. Right, more goods mm-hmm. than they usually are. So if demand is increasing, mm-hmm. that means there's like m- more, that means prices will rise. Right. Which means it costs more money to buy those things. And a good way to put it is that there's um, lots of money chasing fewer goods. Yeah. That's how that's how that one's explained. That's one explanation for inflation. There's too much money, which causes prices to rise because there's more people trying to buy those goods than usual. That's right. And the uh, I think one example here, Professor John T. Harvey at TCU, he's who I was talking about earlier where he's like, no, that's not really true. Yeah. He says inflation happens first. And that they don't increase the supply of money beyond demand. Because the you wouldn't need – you need more money because prices are going up. So then that brings more money in the market, right? That's right. Growth accompanies the inflation. It doesn't cause it. Yeah. So, again, this is uh, – all these economists are saying, no, there's too much money. And this mm-hmm. guy's saying, no, the, the prices are rising, which brings more money into existence. And in the meantime, everyone else in the room is like, I, I got to go to the bathroom. I got to go take a call. I got to go get some more <laughs> right, exactly. finger foods. Yeah. And the, I, we say it every time, but the fact that you have liberal c- economists and conservative economists, sure. that right there is – that reveals it all. It's all made up. It's all yeah. hoodoo. Let's take a break on hoodoo. That's – Nice little cliffhanger. That was my signal. And we'll come back and talk about two other theories that are kind of the same thing (laughs) right after this. (laughs) 
So, Chuck, I just yeah. want to say you're doing great, by the way. <laughs> well, that's because I haven't gotten to those paragraphs yet. It's going to be just easy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, there are another couple of theories. Uh, again, economists are going to agree and disagree about these two theories. They are the cost push theory and the demand pull theory. It's even right there in the title, push and pull. It, essentially, it's the same action going on, but one is choosing to look at one side and one's choosing to look at the other. Right. So cost push means that it's the increase of uh, the cost of like labor uh-huh. or the cost of raw materials. Yeah. Uh, basically anything that's going to end up getting like a loaf of bread on a shelf, mm-hmm. including like the fuel for the trucking and packaging and yeah. all that stuff, that that is what uh, is going to push up in prices, if that is the driver of inflation. Which makes a lot of sense. Like there was um, apparently right now, I don't know if it's still going on, but it definitely was the spring. There was a shortage in wood, in lumber. To, still, to, still happening. Okay, because of at least in part the wildfires that California suffered last year mm-hmm. were so devastating that it actually affected the national supply of lumber. Yeah, and I also read that the lumber uh, people – decreased production overall because they thought because of the pandemic, they right. thought there was going to be a big lull. Right. They didn't want all this extra inventory on their hands. Right. And it turned out everyone was like, no, I want to build stuff now. Exactly. And they just miscalculated. So, so, so not a good time to build a pavilion at your family camp. Let's just say that. Right. Or to try to increase the housing stock, right? Sure. So that means then that lumber going up in price makes building a new house that much more expensive. So the house, the finished product, Mm -hmm. has become more expensive because of the input that raw material lumber. That's a really good example of cost push theory, of why prices are rising because of something downstream in the production process. Yeah, but there's a key little factor here. All of this is true uh, when companies are running already at full production capacity. So that's a really key element there. It can't be... A company that's um, like behind or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like it's a company that's just humming along basically. Right. And then something happens in the supply chain, let's say. Yeah. Big increase in fuel or lumber cost or any kind of raw material. I think, did Dave help us with this? This is a Dave How Stuff Works article. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. I know. Hats off. <laughs> we found another one. But he uses bread as the example. The cost of wheat goes up. The, the cost of flour is obviously going to go up, and the cost of bread is eventually going to go up right. under the uh, the CP theory. And so people like you and I end up paying more for a new house or more for a loaf of bread or more for whatever because right. something somewhere that was a component in that caused uh, this r- rise in prices. Right. That would cause – that would that's the cost-push example of uh, – or theory of, of – Inflation, the kind of opposite of that, but But I don't don't even know if opposite is the right word. (laughs) Uh They say, no, no, no. It's not the raw materials that um, cause the increase in prices. It's actually the demand Mm -hmm. for that finished product that that causes the increase in prices. And so housing right now Mm -hmm. actually is a really good example of both cost push and uh, demand pull. At the same time. Yes. It's, yeah. it's crazy. And it's also demonstrating like, okay, we have <laughs> no idea what's going on. Or at the very least that these things don't exist in isolation. And that is that people, like you are saying during the pandemic, were like, no, we want to move. I don't want to live in the city anymore. I want to live as far away from other sure. people as possible. Yeah. But but only as close as Instacart will deliver. That's sure. as close as I want to live to or, other or people. Or web van. Sure. Web <laughs> <That's laughs> Take out one of those cars. Yeah. Um, so uh, – that it was totally unpredicted, but the upshot of it is that there is a lot of people trying to buy houses right now, and the housing market's just gone through the roof. And so that's caused housing prices to increase, and it's caused, like, all of the other components of the housing market to increase as well. So downstream, that demand for houses caused every bit of housing to increase as a, as a um, result. Yeah, and the example, Dave, to stick with the bread as well, because it's a, I think it's slightly easier to understand than the housing market because it's so weirdly affected by a lot of things right now. Sure. Is that if the cost of, or if a lot of people want bread, uh, the, the baker doesn't immediately raise the prices 
because of that demand um, until they run out of the flour. Then they got to go back and buy more wheat, and the wheat farmer might say, well, now it's a little more expensive. Yeah, there's a lot of bakers who are, have yeah, high demand. Yeah, everybody right wants my wheat right now. Uh-huh. And so that's when the cost is eventually pulled and uh, and then – Increased, I guess, for the consumer. Right. So it looks like if you're just looking at it like, oh, this this wheat price, this raw material rose in, in cost and that caused bread to rise. Mm-hmm. And people are like, no, no, that that's an illusion. It was actually this demand for bread that increased that caused the wheat yeah. to rise. And again, it sounds so – similar to cost push, demand pull does, that it doesn't even matter, but it really does matter. It does matter because, and this part is the key here. If you're at home and you're just like, God, Stop talking. Who cares? <laughs> this is what kind of drove it home for me. The difference in those two, it might seem like just words and nitpicky, mm-hmm. but it's really not because in one scenario, in demand pull, you've got an economy that's really humming and people are like, I want to buy all that stuff. Yeah, it means a lot of people a have lot a demand. lot of money that, that they want to spend and that, yes, that means like you have a, a healthy economy right then. Right, and under cost push, it's more like, hey, uh, people feel like they have to do this repair on their house mm. and I'm sorry, it's just a lot more expensive. It's not like, ooh, I need this new thing. It's like I have to pay for this thing and it's a lot more expensive because of the raw materials or whatever the labor has gone up. Right. And and yeah, it's much worse because that means like you said the the company is humming along at max capacity mm-hmm. and all of a sudden it's like uh we don't have wheat anymore and we aren't going to be able to satisfy demand because we don't have this basic component. It means that there's something broken in your supply chain right. or the the the, or the mechanisms of pr- production. Sure. And that's not a good place to be in. So it's very healthy economy where everybody has money increasing demand or demand increases because you can't supply the basic parts to to create those goods. Right. Okay. I know the beginning of this part, so I'll take it. Okay. And then I have a cot set up in the next room. <laughs> I'm just going to go. I feel like you're setting me up for failure. <laughs> take a little. No, you'll do fine because there's no math. Well, there is math involved, but you'll still do fine. Where is there math involved? Uh, in this part, the in annual rate of inflation there. calculation. Oh, God. <laughs> so, but if if we get it wrong, we'll just say Dave got it wrong. We'll pass that. <laughs> we'll cost push it his way. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. So we're talking about how inflation is actually measured now. And uh, this is a big deal because we like to keep track every year and say that, you know, inflation, what is it usually between about one and a half percent to – Three and a half percent annually in the U.S. generally, unless it's like the 1970s or early 80s. I think over the last several years, it's gone between uh, negative 2.1. Oh, wow. And like five point something percent. Which is pretty – five point something is pretty high. It's generally in the two to three range. It is for our experience. But in the early 80s, it was as high as almost 14 percent inflation. That's bad. Yeah, it was very bad. But not as bad as like the Weimar Republic, Germany or Zimbabwe, (laughs) which we've talked about a million times, where their hyperinflation was just out of control. Yeah, it wasn't that – well, we'll get to that. Okay. So uh, we have to measure the the inflation rate because we like to keep tabs in our economy so the Fed can – can do their weird black magic. And so the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, is who kind of sets this stuff uh, by working through a big data collection system called the Consumer Price Index. It's nuts. It is nuts how big it is. They take – what they try and fill up is what's called the CPI market basket. Uh And it's basically if you imagine a grocery basket that includes everything – Everything, basically. Like 80,000 items. Yeah, and not just groceries. They have 200 categories of products in eight major groups, food, housing, apparel, transportation, medical care, recreation, education, communication, and then other, which is basically everything else. Uh, Funerals and manicures, basically, is (laughs) other. And saunas. Saunas. Yeah, that would definitely – that might be under recreation. You think? I think it might be. Or medical care. It's good for you. Yeah, for sure. You know? Depending on how progressive your uh, your Bureau of Labor Statistics agency is at the time. That's right. So every couple of years. <laughs> Thank you for waiting until I finish that <laughs> uh, The Bureau of Labor Statistics is, uh, interviews 24,000 American families on the stuff that they bought. Yeah, because if you ha- if you want to figure out what 80,000 items you need yeah, to include in this in basket, basket, you have to find out what Americans are actually buying. Yeah, I bought you a slide whistle. 
That's right. They called me up and I said, I bought a slide whistle. That's the only thing I bought this year. They said, you're the one. And they said, that must have been for a very special guy in your life. <laughs> and I said, it's true. <laughs> Wow, I'm blushing right now. Uh, then they have another 12,000 families that are keeping a, a spending diary, basically. It's and, kind of like Nielsen a little bit Yeah, for that one. It did least. kind of remind me of that a little bit because they're just trying to get a big, broad overview of what a typical schmuck here in America spends. Sure. And and you say, where's my 3 or $5? And they just go, they, they hang up real quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Call somebody else. Uh, and then every month they have a big team of assistants that records – the prices of those 80,000 things. And this is an effort to to get just a good look at what that big market basket looks like. Yeah, so two years, they figure out what they need to be buying or what Americans are buying. They use that data for another couple of years. But every month, they go and price all 80,000 yeah. items in that that market basket every single month. Well, yeah. If you're going to figure out inflation, you got to be as current as possible. Yeah. So the, to figure out what item needs to be in the basket. So there's like 200 categories, eight broad categories, 200 subcategories. Mm -hmm. So like transportation will have like auto insurance category. Subway uh, fares. Exactly. Yeah. Um, or food will have like you know, cheese will be one. But in that cheese sa category, sample, I think they call it, there's, you know, a bunch of different kinds. Not everybody buys like Kraft Singles. Some are Velveeta Slice people like me. Oh, man, I used to love Velveeta. It's still good. I haven't had it in pff, decades. I will buy you some, buddy. Do you, do you get blocks of Velveeta? No, we don't get blocks of Velveeta. You get slices now. Okay, but it's not cheese, right? Isn't it cheese no, product? No, it's in no way, shape, <laughs> okay. or form cheese. But I think it's still <laughs> qualifies under the cheese sample in the market basket. That, that But if that you're making a chili labels. cheese dip or something, you got to use it. Sure. Yeah, that's good. No, but this is it's good for grilled cheeses too. Or, uh, of course. So um, that particular brand, but not just that brand, mm -hmm. like the, you know, 16 slice package yeah. they find – it, it makes up 70% of the, the market for that type of cheese. So they'll pick that one. Mm -hmm. They use that for four years and then they go reevaluate it. This is like the, the, the level of detail yeah. the BLS is putting into their, their basket. And so they take all of this and they price it every single month. They literally go to the store. Mm -hmm. and I meant to say literally that time. Mm -hmm. And say, oh, well, the you know, Velveeta cheese slice 16 pack is three forty nine right now. Is that about right? Write the price down? I think so. Okay. And then they go <laughs> back and they type it in. And every month they say, this is how much that this costs. And they compare it, strangely, to 1982. Right. Take it from here, Chuck. <laughs> well, uh, 1982 was basically, uh, was it 1982? Yeah. It's a, okay. That was the, the baseline year where they said, all right, here's our CPI index. Right. It's not an actual, um, it's an index. It's not a dollar figure. I know. I looked everywhere. I'm like, how much does the 80,000, you know, item basket cost in real dollars? They every, won't tell you. Every, they won't. Sorry. Index, buddy. Yeah, they'll talk about UFOs sooner than they'll tell you how much is in that basket, how much that yeah. basket costs. So uh, 82 is when that baseline figure was set, which was the consumer price index is 100. Yeah. Uh, in 2006, it hit 200 uh, in April 2006, which basically at that point they should have said – they should have just reset it and said, we we have a new base year yeah. because we doubled it and yeah. they didn't know. They just – and I'm not sure why really. They just sort of left it I don't know in either. 1982. It seems like a – maybe they're just used to that math. It seems like it would be a lot of extra math. And it wasn't – no, it wasn't that they doubled it. It was that it, it was the exact same in 1982 I think. Or was it that they doubled it? No, it was doubled. Okay. But – they said they should – I mean, some people say they should have said, like, all right, well, we have a new baseline. Right, I got then. you. But they're still using the 1982 instead. I guess. I just, I just don't know why. I don't either. Or but why not? That. Maybe it makes perfect sense. So so the actual um, number that they come up with is a number that's relative to the amount that it costs in, in 1982. Yeah, this is where I kind of got a little foggy. So, for example – And by that, I mean – Fell asleep on my desk. In in uh, 2019, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, for that basket of goods was 249.222. Okay. Meaning that that amount of goods cost uh, almost two and a half times what that same basket of goods would have cost you in 1982. 
Sure. So you say, okay, I don't care how much it cost in 1982. I want to know how much it's affecting me now. And they say, well, just settle down, settle down. They can take that number and say, well, how much was it last month? Yeah. Or how much was it last year? So they can compare, say, like the 2019 and 2020 CPIs and find that there was a difference of something like about 3.026 between those two numbers. Then they divide that by the 2019 um, number, Mm -hmm. and they get the actual percentage that says the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, the amount of uh, basically what it cost people to just live in 2019 was 1.2% less than it costs in 2020, which means that inflation rose 1.2 percent between 2020 and 2019. Right, and when you hear about inflation, annual inflation rate, that is generally what people are pointing to. Yeah, but as we will see, that is not how everyone likes to look at inflation. There are other things to take into consideration. Uh, I think the Fed likes to look at core inflation, mm-hmm. which is that CPI minus. Uh, volatile things like food and energy, things that like the prices kind of go up and down uh, more volatively. Sure. (laughs) Is that a word? Yeah. Yeah. Molybdenum. Yeah, molybdenum. Molybdenum. Uh, And then (laughs) the Fed also looks at uh, another data set compiled by the uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis. This gets a little wonky, but it actually does make sense. The difference between the BLS and the BEA indexes uh, comes down to the fact that if Chicken cost a lot more money all of a sudden because of some supply shortage or whatever, uh-huh. or increased demand rather, then people might go to the other white meat. Right. And say, well, I'll start buying pork then. Yeah, that was uh, explained by Benjamin Applebaum from the New York Times economics blog. Benjamin? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. He said, I swear to God, I nailed it. Applebaum? Applebaum. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's my imaginary friend, <laughs> Benjamin Applebaum. <laughs> Um, so uh, he was he was explaining it like that. That that's the difference. That people adjust. Like we're not just like automatons. Right. We're like okay, well we're buying chicken and Even that's all we sure. eat, and we also buy X amount of hot dogs. It's like yeah, if the price of chicken goes up, you're going to eat something else that month. That, that's if just how be, people yeah. do. Mm-hmm. And so he was saying that the. Um, Bureau of Economic Analysis really is much better at taking that into consideration. And so since about 2000, the Fed's kind of relied a little more on that one than the uh, CPI. But the CPI is still very much the most broadcast one. But it turns out that economists use whichever one suits their needs on any given month to say, our policies are right and yours stink. That's a great place for a break. And we'll come back and talk about why inflation even matters and what we can do about it which is nothing, right after this. All right. So we're back to wrap this up. This wasn't as bad as <laughs> this wasn't as bad as I thought. Why is that funny? I'm just I'm glad we're reaching <laughs> the end here. I'm glad to see that you've come around. A little bit. You did great explaining everything. Oh, I appreciate it. So uh strength of Dave's uh research, I think. Sure. Not like the John Muir person. <laughs> Dave's wonderful at his work. He is. He's great. Uh, so inflation can be a bad thing because of some sort of obvious things. But uh, one is if you have a fixed income and you're living off a pension or something, mm-hmm. a lot of times, most times, that pension isn't going to go up because inflation goes up. Luckily, Social Security does. It's tied to that CPI, mm-hmm. um, which was a really smart thing. To make people like not absolutely loathe Social Security in every way. Sure. Uh, but yeah, Social Security will go up, but it, your pension won't. So that's no. a big deal, and that's why inflation matters. Yeah. I mean, it also stinks for those of us who are like, man, I'm paying way more for bread than I was this time last year, and why should I? Sure. Um, it also has an effect on investments, too. Yeah. Um, it, it, remember, a different way of looking at inflation is not just that prices are rising, but that the buying power of the dollar is going down. Yeah. So that, that includes means, your investment. Yeah. If you have an investment that's worth ten grand, 
uh, you know, five years from now, it's still the dollar amount still worth ten grand, mm-hmm. but the value of the dollar is far less than it was five right. years before, and so that ten grand just doesn't amount to quite as much. Uh, another thing that can happen is your interest rates might go up, or uh, not your interest rate will reset. But if you go to buy a house or something, the interest rate might be higher because. A bank might say, you know, I think inflation is going to be pretty bad this year. Yeah. So uh, we gonna we're gonna have to charge more money on that loan because we're losing that dollar value. Right. Exactly. And banks don't like losing money. Um, there's also like a lot of uncertainty that could come when inflation is going on. Remember, I said infl- like there are a lot of inflation fears until today. Mm-hmm. Um, that has a really deleterious effect on business <laughs> in that. Um, they don't, it's harder to plan for the future. They don't know how much the cost of the goods that they need to make their finished products are going to be, right? So yeah. you don't know, you know, if you're going to buy a whole bunch of, you know, mealworm spray for your your flour yeah. to make bread with, um, is it better to buy it now? Is it better to buy it later? And how much am I going to price this bread for? I, it's, it's just a catastrophe. And then yeah. they eventually just give up and go home and watch Judge Judy. Yeah, I got to say that's um, – like with Emily's small business that I think especially with small businesses, she can't just be like, oh, well, shipping is a lot more now because fuel costs are going up right. or packaging is increases. So she can't just raise and lower her prices willy nilly when you're a small business selling soap and lotion and candles. Which is funny because that is one of the major explanations for <laughs> inflation. I know, but you just can't do that as a right. small business. You can't be like, oh, our soap's a quarter more all of a sudden. It's true. Or a quarter less. Like, mm-hmm. she kind of has to lock in for a little while. Like, a price increase for a small business like that is sort of a big deal. you got to really think it through. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, I do. Um, and that's actually another problem with it, too. It's like if, if Emily can make less money um, selling her wares, but she's paying more to make them, her, mm-hmm. her profit margin declines in that sense, she might have less to expand mm-hmm. um, to hire more people. Totally. And so that has a ripple effect through the economy where it can affect employment. Higher prices yeah. can actually lead to lower employment. Yeah, like she gets killed on shipping. That's her big one. Mm-hmm. Like she loses – money, a lot of money every year on shipping costs. But you can't just like, she's not Amazon, so she can't yeah. can't ship for free, and you can't also charge what it really costs right. to ship. You just have to kind of take the hit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I guess we can talk about hyperinflation a little bit. We've covered it a few times over the past 13 years, but <laughs> we really have. The, the one big one that people always talk about is, like you mentioned earlier, the Weimar Republic of Germany, mm-hmm. when the mark exploded from 2,000 marks to the U.S. dollar in 1922 to 4.2 trillion marks to the dollar uh, less than a year later. Isn't that nuts? That is. I mean, you can't even wrap your head around. And remember in Zimbabwe in – Yeah, that oh, was I the other one. I can't remember what, what decade it was, the 80s maybe or the 90s, where they were they were like using wheelbarrows to cart trillion-dollar bills yeah. <laughs> um, to the grocery store and still could barely buy bread or toilet paper with it. Yeah. The U.S., like I said earlier, it had its own brush with – I don't know if you call it hyperinflation, but definitely much higher inflation than anybody was comfortable with. Uh, and that actually came – I was researching this today. A lot of people blame the um, the OPEC oil embargo, mm-hmm. um, a lot of other stuff. But it apparently can all be laid at the feet of Richard Nixon who juiced the economy. He fired his Fed chairman and replaced him with a, a sycophant who had no formal economics training and then started telling him what to do. That sounds familiar. <laughs> to juice the economy yeah. to get reelected. And it worked for a minute. And then all of a sudden it was like this plane going up and then the, the gas was no longer in the fuel injector right. and it started to just tumble back toward the earth. We had almost 14% um, uh, inflation. Yeah, huge I mean, that's, unemployment. that's a real number that like makes an actual difference in American families like getting what they need. Right. Yeah, for sure. Gas and food and, you know, paying bills. Yeah. So it took a good decade or so to come out of that, yeah. that death spiral that it was in. And it took the Fed. And this, is a, this was actually a big reason why the Fed plays such a big role in, in the economy today is because of that. The Fed had to step in and basically do the opposite of um, easy money and basically 
get money off of the market to basically say all these people who have money right now, we need to take some of their money to lower demand to cause prices to go down. And it was a really hard time to be uh, an American uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, because it caused this, uh, the great inflation and then a pretty big recession. Yeah. Uh, there are a few things that the Fed can do to, uh, you know, one thing that you might see on stupid Facebook comments is like, just print more money, Fed. That's all they do anyway. Just put more cash into the economy. They don't do that. The Fed doesn't just print more money. Mm -hmm. uh, they can influence the money supply, though, in a few ways. Uh, one is there's something called the reserve requirement, which is basically they say, you know what, if you're a bank, you have to have a certain percentage of your customer deposits that you don't you can't touch. Mm -hmm. You got to leave it in there in reserve. So they can lower that requirement a little bit, uh, meaning that in theory, more money can be in circulation because they're loaning out more or they're able to loan out more. Right. So that's one thing they can do. Um, they can also, uh, they actually buy and sell bonds. This is where it gets so crazy to me. Like, this just sounds so weird. But I mean, there's a whole market there that yeah. actually is basically how money gets on or off um, the market in the economy. There's a, there's sales of bonds where yeah. companies can buy bonds, companies can sell bonds, um, and the Fed will buy or sell them too. And when the Fed buys bonds, it's putting money on the market. And when the Fed sells bonds, it's accepting money. It's taking money off the market. It's yeah. trading those bonds for money and making sure that that money isn't in circulation anymore, mm -hmm. at least temporarily. That's what's happening today. They're going to auction off $100 billion in bonds. Wow. So $100 billion will not be in the economy tomorrow right. after this auction today because the Fed's taking it off the market, which was enough to, um, to calm those inflation worries. Everybody said, oh. The Fed's stepping right. in, it's fine. Well, no, they're like 100 people that understand that said, oh, okay. Right. And everyone else just read the headline, TLDR, <laughs> right. and said, all right, we're not supposed to worry, so I won't worry. But at the, same, at the same time, you made <laughs> reference, though, earlier that it was like Joe Biden screwing up the economy, sure. that they were blaming those stimulus checks for everything from people not working purposefully right. or to um, there being too much money and increasing demand for regular stuff. Mm -hmm. And the the whether that's true or not, the Fed's stepping in and yeah. saying, well, we're just going to get some money off the market. Another thing the government can do is the opposite of something like stimulus checks. It can actually raise taxes. Sure. And that's another way for the government rather than the Fed to get money out of circulation by, by taking it from people's, you know, end of year account. Right. End of year account. Sure. Uh, and then the other – the final thing the Fed can do is they can lower their discount rate, which is uh, the rate that it's going to charge a bank for a short-term loan. And in theory, if a bank is paying less for a loan, then they can lend at a lower rate as well right. if you're going and asking for a loan. And then lastly, there's supply-side economics. Another thing the government can do, which is basically deregulate industry in the hopes that it will make industry leaner, more competitive, all that stuff – and that that will cause prices to go down because businesses will become more efficient when it's dog eat dog. Right. I think we've seen, thanks to Reaganomics, that that doesn't necessarily work very well. That's what they say. That's my two cents. And hey, man, I'm just as much an economist as any economist. It sounds like it. Uh, if you want to know more about economics and inflation and stagflation and deflation and all deflations, go do some research and it will blow your mind. And since I said that, it's time for Listener Mail. Uh, I'm going to call this one of the many great responses from our Girl Scout episode. Uh, good morning, Josh and Chuck. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the pleasure of listening to the Girl Scout episode when I was sewing the badges onto my daughter's vest in time for our bridging ceremony. Uh, my daughters are fourth generation Girl Scouts, and I'm a third generation leader. I love this. Yeah, Very big great. in our family. Yeah. Uh, I had the honor to serve as one of five leaders in a multi-level troop. Our troop is girls from kindergarten through seventh grade, uh, encompassing Daisy Brownie Jr. and cadet levels. Uh, we formed as a multi-level troop so sisters could be in the same troop. That's Aww. really sweet. Yeah. And so that their parents uh, could have one troop to keep track of. Uh, it's a great way for the older girls to practice leadership skills with the younger girls and gives the younger girls role models. This sounds that great. Very sweet. They should do this everywhere. Yeah. Everyone else is doing it wrong. She said, but no Juliets are allowed. <laughs> yeah. No Juliets. 
Another unique thing about our troop is that we do not charge dues. Everything our girls do from uniforms, programs, supplies, and activities are funded solely through cookie sales. Nice. Uh, we ask new girls to buy their first vest for the uniform, and from there, cookie sales take care of the rest. Uh, Caroline here leads the daisies in their troop mm-hmm. and says, even at the youngest levels, the emphasis is on a girl-led experience. That means they choose their uh, activities and badges, plan and run the meetings, practice leadership skills uh, each chance they get. It takes a lot of practice and self-control on the part of the leaders to give the girl space to lead, but the end result is so rewarding. Uh, I will leave you with one last lesson that I've learned okay. uh, in Girl Scouts and a motto that my family has always lived by. This is great. This is what everyone should do. Leave a place better than you found it. Oh, yeah. Whether it's cleaning up a little extra garbage at the campsite or making a positive impact on the people and places you come across in life, uh, leave it a little better than you found it. Uh, thank you for all the many years of podcasts that have brightened many a dull car ride and countless rounds and chores for my family, except for the inflation episode. Huh, that's weird. How'd she know? <laughs> <laughs> so that is from Caroline in Richfield, Minnesota. And uh, she sent in pictures of the daisies and uh, the girl bridging ceremony. And it's just adorable. These cute little girls in their masks. For sure. Doing stuff. Yeah, who was that? That's uh, Caroline. Caroline, that's what I thought. Thanks a lot, Caroline. That was some great info. I'm glad you enjoyed that episode. We enjoyed it, too. Um, and uh, I guess that's it, huh, Chuck? Yeah, I should point out, she wrote back and said, by the way, my husband is going to be jealous. I'm getting this on listener mail. I should mention that he went through Boy Scouts all the way through high school just so he could go camping. All he did was enough to get the badges so he could qualify for camping trips. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> That's great. To the rest of them, he said, we don't need no stinking badges. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Well, if you want to get in touch with us like Carolyn did, uh, you can do that via email. Uh, Send us one to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.